talks about the way in which we live within a sort of cross of reality. So there's inward, outward, forward, backward would be a rough way to think about it. So forward is forward in time. So we relate forward in time through commandment. We instruct or we are instructed to do things in the future. We can relate back through memory and recounting the things of the past. We can relate inward. Um, song is the sort of speech through which we relate inward. And he argues very much that speech is what holds us together on all of these axes. So song within ourselves, when we're feeling most ourselves, when we're feeling most uh, at liberty, we, we sing, uh, even within ourselves, if we're just humming to ourselves as we're going about our daily business. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power in Tbilisi, Georgia, on a day when there's a little bit of snow outside. Not, not what we Alaskans would call snow, but what certainly what the Georgians would call snow. Just a little bit on the branches. Uh, yeah, so it's a cool day. Well, today we have an Anadromist dialogue and we have Alistair Roberts returning this time, he's actually, he, he had gotten married earlier this year, and he is spending part of his year uh, in New York City, but I'll let him explain. We had a wonderful conversation. I was interested in some of his ideas about imagination, particularly imagination in going back and looking at the texts of the Bible and how the two work together, but also we ended up having a fascinating discussion about time. So we're going to do that in just a minute. Before we do, have you subscribed to this channel yet? Do you like this channel? If you do, show, show it somehow. There is a link down below if you wish to contribute. And if you don't have any cash or you've already contributed, thank you very much. You can actually share the video with someone or share one of my other videos. All that is very helpful because I don't think I get a whole lot of love from the YouTube algorithms. I don't know what they're looking for. Neither does anyone else. I just do what I do. If it's not the right thing, so help me. Uh, <laughs> and now let's welcome Alistair Roberts back to the channel. Well, uh, good afternoon, or is it evening there? I, uh, it's evening here. It's 10 p.m. Yeah. It's still dark in the morning here, so we're both in the dark, uh, although my light will change subtly as we go here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, since I have you visually, I'd like to just congratulate you on your marriage uh, last year. It sounds like you had a fine year. Thank you. Yes, it was a wonderful year. We got married on May the 14th, and so we've been happily married for several months now. And you're in New York City as we speak? Yes, um, in Queens. So we're yeah. dividing our time between New York City and the exotic Stoke on Trent. Where in Queens? Forest Hills. Okay, that's a nice area. And uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you've been posting some pictures of. Uh, the Strand, which was one of my hangouts in New York City, I used to make my rounds, and I, I lived in the uh, west, in the East Village. I lived in Soho, and the East Village, um, and I would often, I would, I would have rounds, and the Strand was always on my rounds where I would walk. Yeah. We've really enjoyed the Strand. I suppose the interesting thing for me is how many conversations have started in the theology section how many people mm. we've met and contacts we've made through that and then Susanna bumped into almost literally um Bill Clinton a few weeks ago 
in the Americana section. No, that's funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's upgraded itself over the years, but basically it's the same overwhelming place. <laughs> it's got an incredible collection. Um, I really do enjoy it. Um, New York, more generally, I don't think is the equal of um, London or many parts of the UK, I think, are just better served for bookstores. But it is. Yeah, I would agree. The that the, is, again. I would agree that the uh, uh, the book, uh, as far as like I've been to different countries and I think uh, as Americans, we are a little lesser on the scale of readers. And while we have obviously lots of books in America, I think per capita, we don't read as much as other countries do. And I've noticed this when I go to uh, the UK. And I've also noticed this, for instance, in in uh, Paris. And I've noticed this in uh, Prague when I've been there. It's just there are certain sections there. It seems like there's a bookstore on every other street yep. and they're different from each other. Um, unfortunately, here in Tbilisi, they are... Uh, there's like one chain. It's like literally uh, you go everywhere and it's the same books in every chain. That's just me, a shame. It is. It is. And uh, I have a friend here uh, who wants to, would uh, in his dreams, would love to start a bookstore here. But it's such, we're just off the shipping lanes. Yep. So just getting stuff here is very, uh, it's not cost effective. So. That is a pity. So, I've, I found um, the blessing of being where we are in Stoke-on-Trent is just lots of little, little interesting bookstores around. And mm -hmm. then when we go down to London, I've got a big book full of bookstores in London to visit. So yeah. gradually yeah. working through some of those. Yeah. in um, I remember when I was younger, I'm 67 now, and I lived in like a small town like Petaluma. And there were no chain bookstores yet. And yet there were a couple of bookstores. There was this one, I think it was Alta's bookstore. Was this, and the woman Alta would be in there. She'd be smoking cigarettes. But it was a small little store filled, absolutely filled to the rafters with books. And you had to kind of like edge your way past the books. But I found so many interesting books there. And it seems over time what had happened in America was that we had uh, essentially taken the, the independent and used bookstore market and thrown it out to replace it with chains. And some of them, like obviously I think uh, Barnes & Nobles is a pretty great chain. Uh, but even still, when you're dealing with a chain, it's not the same. And uh, yeah, so... The other thing in New York is you have some really good libraries that I need to make more use of. Yeah. But, um, Stoke doesn't have that, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Um, but have you uh, have you spent time in the main branch of the New York uh, Public Library? Um, I've visited it. I haven't spent yeah. significant time yeah. there now. It's it's got it's got all the books you can't take out. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's uh, well, all the there's there's a, a an actual branch across the street where you can do your uh, usual library uh, relationship, but the, the but the big one is just so impressive for how you know it's it's one of those like the British Library or something. I don't think quite as good as the British Library because when it comes to uh, books, we're never quite as good as the British, <laughs> but uh, well worth a visit. And and with a a thought in mind, you know, yep. go researching something. I find not going with a thought in mind just I end up picking up so much when I go to the Strand and other places like that. Although the oh, thing yeah, is, yeah. a place like the Strand, they're generally priced in a way that you're not going to find any huge um, deals there. You'll find a lot of good quality books at a reasonable price, um, fairly reasonable price. You're not going right. to find anything remarkable, but I'll often find remarkable books in other bookstores in the UK. They just have a bit more mm -hmm. of an eccentric mm -hmm. collection 
and they're not just halving the price of the regular retail price, which yeah, tends to yeah. be the case in the Strand. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of these kinds of stores have become places where the publishers slaughter books at half price, and the Strand will be first on in the line to get those books, so they'll have the pick of the uh, the crop, but also the large chains will as well. So. Um, let's, uh, shift to discussing, since we're discussing books, I, I thought it would be interesting to, uh, talk about imagination, which is something I know you've spent a while thinking and, uh, writing about. And, uh, and you've talked about it from a Christian perspective, but before we even get going, I'd like to, I think there are probably people who will be watching this who don't who, when they think imagination, they tend to think fantasy. They tend to think uh, these, you know, science fiction, horror. Uh, they tend to think of these. These. They don't. They don't appreciate that. For instance, studying history is an act of imagination. So, why don't you just des describe how, in your studies, how you've come to appreciate imagination? Well. My studies are mostly in the reading of scripture and especially scriptural narrative. And narrative is something, of course, that engages our imagination. Now, when we think about the imagination in relationship to narrative, it can be helpful to distinguish between the ways that we might um, boil down a narrative into a set of facts, a certain set of things that happened. And a narrative is more than just that set of facts. It's more than just a vehicle to give you certain information. It's a way of construing the world, and it's a way of relating to those particular facts as meaningful in conjunction with each other and with other things. So when we're reading through the scripture, one of my arguments that I constantly return to is that we need to read the text with a sense of imagination, with imaginations ready to be informed, and with the understanding that the text is trying to engage us at that particular level. So, for instance, when people read history, it's often uh, people can have this sense that history is just the facts. It's just the series of things that happened. But a historian is always making choices in what they include, where they begin the story, who they focus upon, who are the significant characters, what are their major actions, what are the um, great events that characterize this particular era of history? What are the inflection points for certain movements? Whatever it is, all of these things are more than just facts. They're construals of the facts. They're, um, it's understanding the world is always freighted with meaning. And your imagination engaging with, first of all, in the case of the author or of, the, of a particular history, in presenting those facts in a particular way, in a way that's narrated, that's freighted with and ordered with meaning so that those who are reading it can read it not just as a record of a series of facts, but as something that gives them a sense of what those events meant. Um, what was the significance of what occurred? Now, when we're reading the scripture, scripture is engaging with us at that level of narrative, and it will do that in very subtle ways, sometimes using um, incredible literary artistry. Sometimes it will be having two stories next to each other, and we're invited to read one story in light of the other. And so there's a particular framework placed upon the facts. Sometimes it will be a particular repeated paradigm or motif. Um, so if we're listening to a piece of music, um, you're listening to a particular passage of a symphony, for instance, and you can see that some element of the earlier part of it is recurring. And Yet there's some variation and development of that theme. And that is one of the things that helps you to understand that particular passage, to enter into it, to have a sense of what it's doing, where it's going, etc. Now, Scripture is often doing the same sort of thing. It's dealing with things like a pattern such as creation. And so in the, in the first chapter of our Bibles, we have the story of creation, the seven days of God's work leading up to the beginning of chapter two. And then you've got this pattern laid down there that is repeated on several other occasions. So if you're reading 
the book of Exodus and the description of the creation of the tabernacle, it follows a seven day pattern twice over. And so that's giving you a particular way, not just to think about, oh, the tabernacle, the instructions were given to us so that it could be constructed according to this particular model. It's also giving you the way to understand that, that this is a cosmic model. It's patterned according to the creation of the universe. And so that is the sort of thing that I think is an example of how our imaginations are engaged by scripture, how scripture is formed in a way that is that exhibits the work of an imagination and the way in which, as we open up our imaginations, we'll just find so much more in the text than we would do otherwise. So that's one example. We can also think about the ways in which these texts are not just bearers of information, um, they're things that we perform. So we might um, sing a psalm. And a psalm is often something that is not just a particular text that should be seen as, uh, we can often spatialize things. So we think of a text primarily as an entity upon a page. And so we think of context as the body of material around it. But if you're listening to a poem, um, or if you're listening to a song, they play out in time. And the context is, in many ways, what's gone beforehand, what's coming next, and then the wider um, the room into which you're speaking, the people to whom you're speaking, these sorts of things. So if you're listening to a psalm, a psalm is often a movement that is supposed to shape your way of relating to reality. And you can often see in the Psalms, there are, as, there are a series of developments in the psalmist's emotional state that is, again, something of an emotional imagination, how he emotionally constructs and spiritually relates to the facts of some things that have occurred. So let's say the wicked are prospering and he seems to have fallen upon hard times. How does he relate to the Lord and his circumstances and the wicked within that situation? And the psalm will often go through a series of phases until there is some sort of resolution achieved. Now, that may not have changed the external circumstances, but the psalmist's relation to those has changed. Now, when we're thinking about all sorts of realities in our world, they are constructs of the imagination. If you think about um, the reality of a nation, a nation is not something you straightforwardly see. A nation is something that's formed by imaginative realities, by the sense of being together as you support a sports team that is playing in your country's name, or the sense of freighted symbolism when you see your flag and or sing the national anthem, or the sense of um, attachment that you have when on foreign shores you meet someone of your hometown. There is a sense of togetherness that is, when you peel away the different layers of it, it's rooted in a sort of imaginative grasp of this reality that is a creature of the common imagination of a people. And so imagination is also then a way in which we construct or construe um, a particular set of objective realities as an intersubjective realm of communication. It's how we make the world or any particular realm within it our home. And so we can think about imagination within scripture as that which is formed in order that we might inhabit God's world well in a way that's formed according to a world of meaning that is given to us um, as a work of um, imagination within the text itself. So... Um, I think it has been spoken of um, imagination as an organ of apprehension, an organ of of comprehension, uh, a way of meaning. And I know in you have an essay where you talk about uh, how Protestants have tended to major on the um, the intellectual without seeing that the imaginative is behind it. Michael Polanyi, in his uh, book, Personal Knowledge, talks about that even science, which we tend to think of as this rock-hard, 
intellectual thing. Where do the hypotheses come from? They they start in the imagination. Exactly. They don't start. They start in our relationship to the stuff of Earth. And and I think that seeing it that way, also Barfield talks this way as well. I don't know if you've read much of him. I have, but, yeah. Saving the Appearances is a wonderful book. Well, yeah. just sparking thought on the imagination and its power. Absolutely. And that really helped me, along with uh, listening to some of Hans Ruckmacher's lectures, helped me to understand that when we, for instance, we're reading the Bible, if you're reading it with a 21st century mindset, oh, help us. How can you understand the past when you're, you know, it's just like, well, how come they didn't have uh, smartphones? Well, you know, that kind of thing. We we tend to, without really entering into the text, and uh, I, I have a... Um, a couple of uh, videos that I interviewed my friend John Sandry from uh, Swiss Labrie. And he he spends a lot of time talking about understanding the text very exclusively. But what he's meaning is you have to understand the poetics of the text. You have to yeah. understand the, you have to kind of start to see to the best of your ability, which of course grows with time. You have to kind of see that world. So it helps to do some other res uh, research to be able to understand uh, the kinds of metaphors they might be using, the kinds of what their world was like when they're walking along the street. Just the more you can use, I think Barfield would call it, it's like an act of imagination to put yourself in the past, but also to realize that the world you're living in is created with all of the imaginations of people around you. So you're not, yeah, this yep. is really dangerous when it comes to propaganda because that can feed our imagination. But how are language, you seeing Language, I think, Barfield's discussion of language is really important here. The yep. way that, and this is something that I think within um, post-modernity, people have become a bit more alert to, the way in which language provides uh, home for being, that we inhabit worlds that are construed for us by um, systems of language. Now, that can be taken in all sorts of dangerous relativistic ways, but there is a core truth there that is getting at the reality of the imagination as that which can be, to a certain extent, um, presented in a public shared realm. The imagination is not just this private subjective thing. Um, it's connected with the world of stories, the world of um, of language, more basically. And when you, for instance, and this is something that I think is very helpful to think about language, not just as something that signifies, but something that symbolizes as well. So if you um, are in the middle of the desert and you hear a snatch of your language, your mother tongue, on the breeze and you've been wandering for for a few days and you're trying to find some sort of civilization that voice conjures up an entire world it's a fragment of that world but it's not mm -hmm. just you're not just thinking about what did that word say what was the object that that was pointing towards it could be any object but as part of the language it symbolizes the entire world from which it comes and i think right. That's a characteristic of language more generally, that we can think about the way that the language of scripture is part of this coherent world that we're invited to inhabit. And that's mm -hmm. partly something that occurs when, um, and, and this is something I always stress when we're dealing with scripture, this is not just, um, I, I like N.T. Wright's illustration, we're not just like the teenage girl reading um, Jane Austen and looking for hopeful parallels. With those right. who are invited to inhabit this and to see this as an account of our own world that we are living within. And the draining away of meaning from the world um, as words become, metaphors become dead. And um, the metaphors continue to exist in some sense, but we become inured to them. Um, I've found as an exploration of Barfield and um, Lewis particularly the magician's nephew. Um, Susanna Clarke's Piranesi is a great novel to explore that particular development. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Barfield also talks about common sense as a word, and he says that it's not necessarily that we share a common sense with the people from the past, which is, I think, one reason why often when people come with this, well, these days, postmodern mindset to the Bible, they tend to be, for instance, I've because I deal a lot with aesthetics and cultural change, I noticed that uh, right now I'm doing a series called The Cute and the Creepy. And the creepy, for instance, has become a way that people are now looking at the past. So they will tend to see puppets and dolls and clowns, uh, old Halloween costumes that nobody at the time saw as creepy, as creepy, because that's in our common sense now that people use this language, use these, but they're also, while they're at the same time they're using them, they are categorizing the world in a new way. And they do, they think that the people in the past, I, I've often argued with people, they said, no, clowns have always been creepy. And, and I'll hear younger people, people under, under mm, 35, 40 or so, will often argue, you know, clowns have always been creepy. And, and I can, I have two books that I've picked up. One is a, a dictionary of, it's called, a, well, an encyclopedia of clowns and tricks, tricksters. And that was uh, printed in the mid nineties. And then I have a book called the book of clowns. It also deals with the history of clowns. It's from 1980. In none of these books, is there any reference at all to clowns being uncanny, scaring people, anything like this. And mm -hmm. so we, in our present world, have changed our common sense. And we've done it. And, you know, Thank you, Stephen King, for the book It. You helped do that. Uh, there, and then as soon as he pointed that out, all sorts of other people jumped on the bandwagon and started literally creating the notion of the scary clown. Um, and, and I think that we don't understand, you know, that when we look back at the scriptures, they're not, they're common sense. As Barfo point out is, for instance, if you even went back into the 1950s today, you would be surprised at the world they're looking out at through in their eyes. And it's and, not just something in private consciousness it's a public shared consciousness mm -hmm. of yeah, what the world yeah. is and this is something i often try and alert people to when reading the scripture that they're not working within the same sort of abstract logic framework that we are familiar with um, right. there is a sort of concrete logic where things are analogized on different levels of reality and scripture i think makes stronger claims about this than just this is a particular mental framework there's something right. about this that is congruent with reality itself, that reality right. in the conceptual frameworks of the modern world, something has been, we've lost the ability to perceive something that's really true about the world. And so that sense of um, reality is having analogies between different levels. There's something about the heavenly bodies that is analogous to the human being and the mm -hmm. human being's relationship to the world. You see this particularly, I think, within something like the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a model of the cosmos. It represents the highest heaven within the cube of the Holy of Holies and then the sort of antechamber to that in the holy place. And then the wider courtyard is another holy realm set off from the, the rest. And that's connected back to the Garden of Eden. It's connected to Sinai mm -hmm. and the different realms mm -hmm. around Sinai. It's also connected to the human body. So if you think about the temple, the temple has five tables with lampstands on either side, like the five digits on your hands on either side. It has the most holy place stores the um, the it has the Ark of the Covenant, which is connected with the throne of the Lord. The Lord is enthroned above the cherubim, above the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant being like the footstool of a, a, a throne. And then you have the um, table of the law that's treasured within that, just as the law of God must be treasured within our hearts. And then you go out and you see the way in which the light and the food are represented with the lampstand and the table of the showbread. And you have 
the sense of smell or taste represented mm -hmm. with incense. And you go further out and you've got the bodily fluids represented by the um, bronze sea. And then you've got the two great pillars at the door of the temple, again, representing the pillars of the human's legs. Now, the temple itself is described as having a tabernacle-like ribs um, clothed with um, sort of skin upon it. Now, that gives us a particular way of looking at ourselves. And when the New Testament talks about your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's not creating that, uh, creating some new metaphor um, mm -hmm. from nothing. It's taking something that was already there within the text. But now you've got this tabernacle building that's operating on many different levels. It's connected to Sinai, it's connected to Eden, it's connected to the human body, it's connected to the cosmos, it's connected to Israel as a polity. And it's also that which orients everything around it. So if you read the story of the Pentateuch, you have Israel brought from Egypt, the construction of this tabernacle being the climax of the book of Exodus, which seems a bit, a bit anticlimactic for us. But in the books that follow, there is the ordering of life within the tabernacle in Leviticus, the sacrifices, etc. Then you have the ordering of the whole camp of Israel around the tabernacle in Numbers. Then the ordering of Israel's life as the tabernacle comes to rest within the land um, in Deuteronomy is down the border just about to enter in. And so there's this sense of here is an imaginative orientation for your entire relationship with the world, your body, um, the nation, um, God, the cosmos, all of these things within this key. And as you orient yourself around this in every single part of your life, you will be formed in your imagination, able to relate these different levels of reality and able to inhabit the world in a way that is good. And there's something about those sorts of ways of approaching the world that are profoundly foreign to the modern mind, which has been formed upon abstractions and has lost the ability to draw analogy and to live within analogy. Yes, I find that one, one of the things that really changed my uh, view of the temple is to realize that once a year, the sacrifice was made and there's no record of anybody cleaning it. So you have this bloody chamber in the middle, but somehow it, that's, that's an image of redemption as well. It's a very, very deep, mysterious image. But when you realize that, you realize, oh, they're not looking at this at all the way I would look at this. You know, I would immediately say, okay, and then the guys came in. But no, you couldn't enter that, uh, that, that holy of holies. So... And that's one of the things that we have brought up in the New Testament as a framework for understanding what Christ does, of course, in the book of Hebrews, that the Holy of Holies is almost like this um, chamber that you can't, it's the fact that you can't enter it that is the big point. Um, you're constantly operating within the antechamber, within the holy place, and only once a year in this event of the Day of Atonement are you entering in, and it's only one person, it's only the high priest. But Hebrews says that's not actually, um, it, it's always looking forward to something that is yet to be done. It's kind of rebooting the system, but mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. rebooting is awaiting the person who will truly enter into that holy place, into the throne room of the Lord. And so yeah. within that whole framework, you have a way of understanding, for instance, human flesh and sin and corruption. You have a way of understanding what it means to be right with God, what that requires. You have a sense of eschatological um, urgency. Some You're waiting some event that's going to fulfill in reality what this is playing out for you. But yeah. that playing out for you is not empty of reality. There's some, it is the reality on some level. It's um, a reality-filled promise. And so those sorts of things are just very foreign to us, along with many other ways of viewing the world. I think mm -hmm. there are a number of factors that have changed our way of viewing the world. I think mass production is really one of them. The fact that we live within almost completely constructed, human-constructed realms, 
and realms that have been constructed according to impersonal logic. So I look at almost any object around me and there are just multiple examples of every single one of those objects. They've they become orphaned from reality in some way. They don't, they're not story. And so there's a sense of the brute reality that surrounds us. Whereas within yeah. the ancient world, that just wouldn't be the case. And so I think even our sense of the world as a place that li- where we live and move and have our being within God's um within God's presence, that's something that seems very strange and foreign to us because we've become so distanced from that because of a way of perceiving the world that is invited and evoked by certain things that we've created in apart from anything else. And there, I think it's worth thinking about the way that whether it's the tabernacle or whether it's modern mass produced objects, things within the world, in addition to stories and um, mm-hmm. other things like that can evoke ways of seeing the world, of imagining the world and of, inhabiting it i think that uh barfield talks about our problems with literalness and i think for instance when we i I, a lot of people have problems with the bible because we are stuck in a prosaic sort of pragmatic world where you would just go take a picture or a, a careful close historian would write something and try to get every fact and detail like Sherlock Holmes or something, picking up all these these details, whereas the Bible was not written by people who had that mindset at all. And and so I find that as uh, Protestants, many Protestants tend to end up holding the bag on this prosaic, pragmatic viewpoint. And uh, you'll meet people who's just like, ah, you know, I haven't got time for all this symbolism and uh, all of this stuff. If I want imagination. I'll go see Star Wars, you know, but it's for children, you know, but but I think if what we're talking about is right, and I, I think it, it is, that once you begin to understand that the, the uh, Barfield once described, um, he said, imagine a person from the Middle Ages suddenly being put into our uh, pers- uh, eyes but yet retaining their view of the world, but being able to see the world we see. And he said, everything stands out, he would say, because, and and uh, Hans Ruckmacher talks about this a lot, that what we consider normal perspective was devised during the Renaissance, that fading away thing. Obviously, it's there in reality, but the person of the medieval age, uh, I think Lewis says they, they wore the world around them like a coat. And so they didn't see this. For instance, they didn't look up the sky and see infinity. You know, and we, it's by using that that we can, but talk, address a little bit this problem of this, uh, uh, what what Barfield would call the idolatry, what what we call the, the just this pragmatic, uh, stripped view of the world that has developed uh, in more modern times. If you have ever read E. A. Burt's the Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science, I find his treatment of some of these things very perceptive. So he talks about the way that within he's dealing with the metaphysics behind Galileo, Kepler, um, all these different Newton all these different frameworks that we'd think of just as purely scientific, but yet there is a sort of implied metaphysics. So for instance, the way in which, I think it's Galileo's vision of the world, everything that is not purely mathematical becomes um, abstracted from the world, removed from the world. And so all that is human, all that gives the world its piquancy and its salience to us is um, treated as second order and not really real. The things that are really real are mathematical entities and the, this sort of mathematical construction of the universe. The idea that the world meanings might be integral to the world, that the world might inte- it might be integral to the world that it has color and that it has that life and personhood, these sorts of things are integral to the world. That just seems strange within the developing 
implicit metaphysics that are adopted as we adopt certain forms of modern science. Now, we don't have to throw out everything about modern science to recognize that these things actually do belong to our world. And that recovery of a way of inhabiting, and, and I think more than seeing the world, we talk about worldview, we talk about seeing the world, which really privileges one sense, almost as if we were standing outside. And again, this is something of our scientific perspective, that we think we're standing outside of this um, inanimate or this um, very impersonal system, rather. And we're trying to understand it according to some sort of mathematical logic or whatever. But we're fundamentally spectators. But primarily, we're supposed to be inhabiting the world to understand ourselves being within it. Now, getting back to some of your points that you raised about a, a story, um, a, a history, not just being a literal, a, a purely a, account of facts, as Barfield discusses, discusses it. This is just something that we should learn as we're attentive to the biblical text itself. Why do we have four Gospels? They're telling the same history, in essence. There's significant overlap between the three so-called synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And what do you do with that? Well, I think one of the first things that you need to do is just read the stories closely and see what the differences are, because the similarities are quite noticeable, but the way that the stories are framed are quite different in certain respects. So you're reading the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness at the beginning of in Mark chapter one or in Matthew chapter four and Luke chapter four. And you read those accounts and each one of them tell the same story slightly differently. So in Matthew, Jesus is led up into the wilderness by the spirit. And that sort of language is language that really is redolent of the story of the, um, of the Exodus. Israel led up into the wilderness, out of Egypt. That movement up into the wilderness is the language of the Exodus, as is the fact it's 40 days. And the order of the temptations, again, evokes the same sort of thing. Whereas Mark, Jesus is cast out into the wilderness, which is a different way of seeing the same thing. The spirit is still involved. The spirit is casting him out. But it's a different thing from leading up. It can be referring to the same movement, the same actual historical fact, but something different is, um, with our attention is being drawn to something different. And in the story of Luke, Jesus being filled with the spirit was led in the spirit into the wilderness. That's the sort of prophetic journey, the sort of visionary narrative that you'd have in something like the book of Ezekiel. Um, the hand of the Lord was upon me and I was led in the spirit to such and such. And actually, if you trace the order of the places that um, Jesus goes to in the temptations in Luke's account, it's the same order as the places in the book of Ezekiel. So there's something of a, a parallel there to be drawn. And I think more generally, as we're reading the biblical text, it invites that sort of engagement. And I think this gets back to one of the bigger points about imagination, that imagination is about primarily receptivity. It's about opening ourselves up to reality through the act of, of um, practiced attentiveness. And that sort of um, practiced attentiveness or attention, we're constantly learning how to listen, to hear, to um, perceive in ways that maybe we had not before. And scripture invites that sort of engagement. I find in my reading of scripture, I generally try and read through a passage three or four times before I ever bring any question to it. I'm trying to see what questions emerge from the passage itself. And I think reality mm. is very much the same way. Right. Um, some of the things you have just discussed remind me of a thought that I've been developing over the years that... I mean, you talk about Galileo, and he he did this thing of dividing the uh, primary qualities from the secondary qualities. And what happened over time was more and more of them were kind of placed into the category of the secondary qualities, so that the only primary quality left was mathematics, which is really ironic to me because that is purely abstract. You don't find numbers lying around on the ground. So um, I 
one of the things that I've come up with is that during Galileo's time, uh, he and the other early modern scientists were, I think they were falling in love with the idea of being able to measure and weigh things. This would later be a problem because I think what they left out of their equations was the concept of time. They devised ways of measuring time, but time isn't the measurement. Time is what happens in between the measurements. That is to say, it, time is always an experience. So I, I'll see people saying, well, time doesn't exist. And then they'll immediately start talking about the clock and all of this stuff. And I'm going like, you don't understand time. Time is, for instance, if there were several different people, for instance, your last year, you spent your last year, um, you know, you're in new marriage time. You know, all of everything in your life is colored by these relationships that we have. And yours is a very good relationship. It won't always be like that. Eventually, there will be illness. There will be a child coming, which will be a very different sort of thing. I am in a very different sort of time because I'm living in a country where they treat time almost erratically. I, you know, some people say, you know, uh, in Mexico, the time is slower than in America. I go like here. No, it's it's literally erratic because sometimes it'll be slow. It looks like nothing is getting done. And then someone will call you. And this happens all the time and say, oh, this is happening yesterday. <laughs> you know, and suddenly it'll move really quickly. And then it'll go back to, you know, this, this kind of the, the Georgians themselves will call themselves lazy. But it's a whole approach to time because what they would rather do is sit together and talk. And I see even teenagers from my window outside just talking. You know, yeah, they they have uh, smartphones and everything else, but they spend an awful lot of time just chatting with each other. And that, for them, is more important. It's more important for them almost to mythologize their existence through talking than it is to have some, you know, it's very different than living in Switzerland <laughs> where things all run on time, you know, but and I think what I've that's, seen, yeah, go ahead. That's one of the problems when we take as our primary framework for thinking about time, the clock, rather than maybe mm -hmm. something like music. Music unearths, I think, the reality of time far more fully than the clock. Can. Oh, yeah. Well, what's happened is uh, there are books that come out that talk about you know, how the body relates to time, scientific research on time. And what I realize is, oh, what you're doing is you're not really describing music. You're describing how we can use music to uh, manipulate people. So, for instance, you know, someone said, you don't really get the effect of music unless uh, a dance rhythm goes on for like over 10, 15 minutes. To which I'm saying, this explains why younger people have this addiction to this powerful, loud rhythm, especially now. I mean, when I was younger, the rhythm used to be more broken up. There were chord changes, you know, um, and now it's boom, 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 boom. because the DJs who were the ones who started counting beats per minute. You know, they realize that certain beats per minute, like 124 and stuff, but that's not anything, to, that's not what music really does. That's how we can use music. If if you use it in a certain way and if you're susceptible, we can manipulate you through music, same as we do with uh, in movies and such. But what I've seen is we now live in a culture that tries to eliminate the effects of time as much as possible. I don't think when when uh, Galileo and Copernicus and all these people were first falling in love with the measurement of reality, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But they didn't have a problem with time either. They lived within a society that was, uh, in a sense, a constantly evolving story. They they were very well aware of it. But what happened was eventually that you know by the time you get to the Enlightenment, people are saying, well, the only things that exist are what we can weigh and measure. And interestingly enough, all the things like love, joy, truth, beauty, all these abstract concepts are in the category of time. They're all relationships. And I think that in time, I mean, I think even men and women differ in their relationships in time. Men being more visually oriented, women being more 
aurally oriented through the auditory system so that women you know men are attracted to a cer certain shapes of women whereas women are attracted to the words of men you know now that isn't to say that they don't cross pollinate all the time and in and terms of time i think there's also the sense that men if they, they the way that they function in time in some ways is more akin to a straight line oriented mm -hmm. towards some target or goal whereas right. there is just bodily a cyclical relationship to time that women have and right. so that's not the full story um and there are complexities and we can't oh, yeah. flatten things out but yet at the same time time is an inhabited reality and there's something about the rhythm of our reality that can't be captured by the sort of measurements that we think in terms of one person mm -hmm. I found very helpful here is um, Eugen Rose, Rosenstark Kursi talks about the way in which we live within a sort of cross of reality. So there's inward, outward, forward, backward would be a rough way to think about it. So forward is forward in time. So we relate forward in time through commandment. We instruct or we are instructed to do things in the future. We can relate back through memory and recounting the things of the past. We can relate inward. Um, song is the sort of speech through which we relate inward. And he argues very much that speech is what holds us together on all of these axes. So song within ourselves, when we're feeling most ourselves, when we're feeling most uh, at liberty, we, we sing. Uh, even within ourselves, if we're just humming to ourselves as we're going about our daily business, or if we're with a group of people, we sing and we have a sense of camaraderie or a unity. It's one of the things that the fellowship of the spirit is described as within the Pauline epistles, something that we're singing together. And then outward through science, through relating to other um, groups or entities within the world, um, that is a different sort of relationship. Now, when we're thinking about time, there is this also people can exist in the same moment in time, but yet um, in a more scientific sense or clock sense, but yet be of different times. And so he mm -hmm. talks a lot about the relationship between distemporaries in the act of teaching, that the teacher is relating to the student and each are relating to each other as distemporaries. There's this movement through time occurring. And he talks also about the way in which we enter into different levels of time. And so the degree to which that cross of reality is expanding or contracting depends upon many different factors. The continuity of a life world through time is a challenge. Um, so for instance, entering into the life of a century through fighting a war, you're fighting for what has gone before, you're fighting for what comes next and to do that to have the sort of sense of self and your place within time to do that you need to be a creature of a century not just someone who's living within that particular moment and yeah. he talks also about the ways that marriage as you describe it or um bearing a child or these sorts of things change the way that we relate to time and that sort of um, relationship between distemporaries is one that's broken down in many ways in our day and age where we focus so much upon technical knowledge and technologies are moving at such a pace that the young as early adopters, those who are on the cut, supposed cutting edge, the digital natives, whatever we're going to call them, um, they are seen to be the ones who are most in tune with reality. And so the process of passing on wisdom for how to inhabit meaningfully a continuing life world and um, the life world has become fractured and so wisdom is no longer operative in the same way and so yeah. our relationship with time is broken down likewise another person i found helpful here is um uh, marshall halbertal who talks in his book on sacrifice about the way that the Could media you say, that, say that name again marshall halbertal so h-a-l-b-e-r-t-a-l on sacrifice. So he talks about the way that the meaning of the past is contingent upon the future and, and vice versa, that what we do now changes can change the meaning of the past. 
So, for instance, the sacrifices and the um, things that my parents did in order to raise me, the meaning of those things, the acts that they performed in the past are contingent upon what I do now with my life. Um, it's mm -hmm. the same way in which a relationship where there's a sense of betrayal, everything about that prior relationship can become curdled in memory um, once that betrayal has occurred. So uh, yes, exactly. a tragic um, breakup or divorce or uh, suicide, whatever it is, these sorts of things can really change the past. And that's something that can't be understood without an understanding of the human character of time and that imagination is integral to the world and how we inhabit it. Yeah, well, I think that, for instance, these three abide, faith, hope, love, all are relationships in time. And I think that that is the biblical perspective. Also, it's all a story, which I, I'm thinking now as I'm talking that imagination is our apprehension of things in a full sense of time. And uh, Tarkovsky points out that time is personal. That is to say that each person lives differently. Each thing, actually, that, you know, when we go down to the subatomic level, all those quarks and gluons and, you know, all of that, they're all different from each other. And the mystery, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, I believe in this hard, you know, facts, empirical knowledge and all of this. And I, and at the same time, if you go all the way down to the bottom, you, you what you'll notice is the mystery isn't that there are these little things there. The mystery is that they're all in relationship to each other. And they, you know, people will say, "Oh, I'm just a bunch of atoms. I should flow, float away." I says, "No, I'm not. I'm a bunch of relationships. I'm a, I am a whole system of relationships within my DNA, within my physical skin. All of these things. They're not going to float away because they're in relationship to each other. And interestingly, the uh, in the world of information uh, theory, they've come up with this." very interesting little phrase and that is it the thing comes from bit the the little bit of teeniest bit of information and that's what you find at the basic basic level of physical reality is that what's already a mystery is that the things are already completely in relationship no matter how far down or how far up you go and so what that tells me is that the most important thing is the information, or as we pull back further, the word. And so yeah. literally in the beginning was the word, in, in uh, the logos, the, in, the relationship, the information, all of those things are there in the beginning. And it can be helpful also to think about the way in which the story of creation focuses upon time. So time is the object of the first day, the middle day, the fourth day. And then the final day. So the first day is not the creation of light, um, as we tend to think about. It is that, but it's the creation of the day and the night, um, the alternation between day and night, that rhythm. And it's as if um, the Lord sets up a beat on that first day. Mm -hmm. And there's this then elaboration of that on the fourth day as the sun, moon and stars are created for time, seasons and the day and the night. There's a delegation of that in a more complicated um, rhythm upon that basic beat. And then on the seventh day, there is a day that's sanctified. And why not just say there were six days of creation? Why is there the seventh that isn't really a day of creation, but is um, part of the sequence? Because that actual day is part of the whole structure of reality um, depends upon this um extra um day which creates this complete ry rhythm and the world would not be created were it not for that sabbath reality being created as part of it and so as we look through the scripture that sabbath principle is one that recurs again and again as as a sort of bud that opens out within the sacri within the sacrificial system you have the evening sacrifice, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, the morning sacrifice. And then it starts to become um, syncopated in various ways. You have the addition of the 
um, special sacrifices for the feasts. And the feasts are ordered according to an elaboration of the Sabbath principle. So the two great feasts are feasts of a week in Lent. The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost um, is a feast that occurs after seven times seven days. And uh, the great festal month is the seventh month. And so there are all these patterns that are elaborations of the Sabbath. And then as you go even further, you can see, um, you think about Daniel, 70 weeks of years, or you can think about the fact that the temple is built in the 500th year, the Jubilee year times 10. The Jubilee mm-hmm. itself is seven years times seven and then the year after that. Or you have the Sabbath year, which is the seventh year. And so this fundamental principle of time is opened out. And then the people are called to inhabit that. And there's a sort of musical reality there that you're constantly being placed within, first of all, this musical reality that has a core principle from which it generates and develops. And then you're being taught to relate to the great works of God within that framework as analogously related to this core principle, to each other across that. And also, we can think about the way that things like if you read through the story of Exodus, there's a very strange jump in chapter 12. So you're reading all this story and then it talks about the Lord speaking to Moses and Aaron when they were in the land of Egypt, telling them how to institute the Passover. You think we've been reading this narrative. We know they're in Egypt. Why are we being given this sort of um this setting of the situation as if they were standing outside of Egypt or we were standing outside of that narrative situation, looking back in when we have been going through the narrative being it right there in the events in Egypt. And there's a sense in which that event of the Passover, it's not just the initial event, it's the institution of a continuing event, the practice that will continue. It's the same thing with the Lord's Supper, of course, at the last Mm -hmm. supper and the Lord's Supper intimately related the institution and the continued practice and that practice is at the same time a recapitulation of that original event where the original event itself almost gets effaced by the institution of the continuing event and then Mm -hmm. that continuing event in drawing people's attention back is also drawing their attention forward to its greater fulfillment and it's the same with the last supper though the last supper is that which we look back to on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. Um, But then we're also looking forward until he comes. This is the anticipation and rehearsal of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so that relationship to time is something that is just integral within our Christian celebrations of our rights. We can think about baptism the same same way. It relates us to all the past history, but also... There is that sense of us being between two, caught between the past and the future. Um, Think about the way that Paul talks about dying with Christ in baptism and then being raised to newness of life. But baptism is that event that's poised between those two realities, death and new life and the past and the future. And that relationship is one that is charged. We can think about listening to a piece of music. It's not just a sequence of discrete notes. The time and the, the, the moments between the notes are charged. And when you are listening to a piece of music, those moments are just electric and mm-hmm. you're waiting for that next note to come or that next chord or that resolution. Right, right. And those moments are some of the most powerful ones, even if no sound is played. And so, as you yeah. say, that relationship yeah. is integral. And I think we see yeah. that very powerfully in music. Yeah, yeah. And and what you say about the day as the first kind of instituted, you know, the, the rhythm of the day and night uh, being the first institution, in a sense, in uh, Genesis. What strikes me is we have this absurd notion that we get with our our strange abstract notions of clock time and that is that i've heard uh george carlin the american comedian talks about like well this is now no wait this is now and and now these are these abstracted whatever this is at this moment at this moment at this moment but i've come to understand that now 
is the day. And yep. you have until the time you wake up, from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed. This is your now. So you actually have within the now a past you can look at. Uh, you have a direction you can go, uh, things to accomplish, and then you have a closure to that day. So this is your your now isn't this abstracted, strange, you know, second. It's rather this a day, each day, which is why I think also um, Jesus puts a lot of emphasis upon resolving arguments and resolving uh, sinful things that need to be forgiven within before the end of the day and yes that's that i think is really quite um that way of inhabiting time is something that we can think about in terms of the sabbath as a practice the sabbath is something that gives us a constant um step practice of stepping back from the immediacy of our work day to reflect upon what we've done in the past what we're ordered to in the future so we can think about the practice of confession of sins that every time when we're coming to worship there is this act of taking stock of what we have done the sins of omission and commission and then receiving forgiveness and absolution and then moving on from that we are commissioned and sent out into the world and so there's an orientation to time that occurs there that I think can be expanded out, but also contracted down. So every single day we can practice something of that. At the end of the day, there is this mm -hmm. period where we can just relax and look back, take delight in those things that we have done and assess the things that we've done as the Lord assesses his own work on the seventh day of creation. And then we can expand that further. What is the now that we inhabit? It's the day. And, and scripture uses that language of the day in a broad sense, a very specific sense. It can be the moment of decision. It can be the, the day of the Lord, which is not necessarily um, seen as one single day. It can be a period right. of time of great moment where everything hangs on what's taking place. The day of the Lord is the moment when... God is going to act climactically, climactically and decisively. And we can think about the way in which our now can be expanded by um, the ways that we relate to the past and the ways that we relate to the future. So, for instance, the idea of personal continuity. I think many people today do not have structures in their life that enable them to have the sort of personal continuity that maybe people had in the past. And so part of it is just the changing scenes around them, the constant changing technology, being hypermobile and um, changing environments, but the way, and also changing relationships, changing communities, the things that would give people's lives a sense of coherence, um, a sense that their now was not just a single moment, but maybe a longer span of time maybe even a century, um, mm -hmm. that is something that's lost. And so even within our own lives, we can feel like we're wandering through them rather than actually holding them together as a unity. And so, well, for, think, instance, so for instance, I think, I think this also of the relates, that, <laughs> <laughs> I think this also relates to uh, our disordered sense of time, which is also related to our technology, which when I was younger, there was much more of a sense culturally of a day of rest. Then more stores were closed, more uh, businesses, you know, uh, would would shut down. And then, because of the presence of technology, particularly now our digital uh, information technology, people almost feel like, oh, I've got to keep you know, the store open, we've got to make more money. It, you know, people are sending us orders 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I, I don't know how it is in the UK. It was when I first visited there in 1978, everything shut down. Uh, not so much in London, although a lot did shut down. But when I was traveling through places like Oxford and Cambridge, Sunday was a day where most everything was closed. And I think that rest, 
I think it speaks of this disordered, almost, uh, what was it? Uh, the word hurry sickness has been used. Yep. The sense of always I have to do more. And, and you can see it where the rubber meets the road in human relationships. What is the most difficult aspect of, of the love relationship today? Well, it's not finding someone to mingle fluids with. It is commitment. And what is yep. commitment? It is the time aspect of love. You know? I think also that commitment is one of the ways we re pre have continuity across time, that we are the same person. We keep our promises to ourselves and to others. And if we're not keeping our promises, then there's no personal, there's not the true personal commitment, that continuity. Absolutely. The fact that I make a promise now and 20, 30 years time, I'll be living that out. Or I make sacrifices now, confident that those sacrifices will be rewarded um, by my future actions. Those things are what make time continue. And it also continues across generations. So if I act in a way that rewards the sacrifices of previous generations and acts in continuity with their commitments, um, I'm enabling a continuity across time of a family or whatever. And it's been very interesting to me seeing the power of Susanna's family having a commitment to a particular place and particular practices of meeting together there that have continued over four or five generations now. And that sort of thing is incredibly powerful. We don't make those sorts of commitments much anymore. And as a result, even within our own lives, we feel fragmented from the sort of people that we were even five, 10 years ago. And that is not a healthy state to, to live in. We might live far longer, but we're not living the same sorts of lives. Our lives are mm -hmm. fractured and fragmented. We're going through moments rather than a coherent, narrated, complete existence. Exactly. And the way that you describe those sorts of relationships between people, again, that's something that's lost. The no. true relationship with people is a sort of harmony of times where the ways that their, their forms of temporality are brought together. And I think this is a great, um, Paul Kahn in his um, work, um, Putting Liberalism in his, Its Place, discusses the episodic character of pornography. And so pornography has no future, there are no children, there are no... Um, it's something that just happens in a single episode and there's no sense of consequences or no sense of a continued practice or um, routine. It's not that sort of thing. And then he mm -hmm. compares that, among other things, to Abraham. And so Abraham has a promise concerning 400 years hence and beyond that. And he lives in terms of something that not even his great-great-grandchildren will get to see. And yet right. that is something that's orienting for him because of a divine promise, a commitment across time that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. We can depend upon him. He is the same as he was in Abraham's time. He's the same as he was at the very creation. And we can depend upon him to be the same to the end of time. And so we can act in a way that establishes continuity of a people um, with, I mean, we are Abraham's children. And that's possible in part because of, I mean, it's possible entirely because God is continuous through time. He is not changing in the way that we are. He's not fickle right. or he doesn't go back on his word. And that, I think, is something that we've lost sight of. And as a result, our times are fractured and we're living within fragments and we have mm -hmm. no rhythm. We can think about the way that on the Internet, there is no day and night. There's not, there's not a Sabbath, but there's not even day and night. You go on no. to social media and it's just this unremitting feed of material. There's no punctuation. There's no um, new paragraph, really. And there's mm -hmm. no sense of a new page being opened. Now, we're right. at the beginning of a new year here. And I think it's one of the things that psychologically we feel that the old year comes to a close. We take stock of what we did in the past year. We make new resolutions. We think, how is this new year going to be different? What are we going to do to make it different? And yeah. we tell our stories in terms of those movements in time. 
which yeah, and, in terms of clock time clearly, don't necessarily register. Yeah, clearly, uh, for instance, your last year was an extremely crucial year because you got married and you started living in a different sort of way in relationship with your wife. And I find when I look at particularly younger people now, and they're constantly looking at their phones and hitting things and writing LOL and, you know, uh, you know, but what it is, is these little messages that they're sent, they don't have the, the, the density of, of a conversation where you, where you, talk and you know depending on the pattern of the conversation with someone but these are just meant to just be scrolled off well part of what's happened is your language has been reduced to a, a, a visual sign rather than an an audible uh spoken word uh, jacques Ellul and the humiliation of the word uh, amazing book he talks about how the word isn't this although this is closer than a lot of other forms, the word is actually to be in each other's presence so that even the silences, the little movements of the eyes, you, you see someone kind of fidgeting at a moment. It's all part of the relationship, the word. And so that if I had, um, uh, for instance, just tape recordings or well, the, not tape, that's whole. If I just had digital recordings of all of these things that I do, which is, fine there's no problem i have with them uh but it would be an awful lonely world and that is what we're creating with our digital technology so that people find the real things difficult yeah real conversation real relationship you know it's funny we have people who are desperate to fix the planet who are completely disconnected from any actual physical plot of land so they don't see the the re the relationship of uh, the us to the seasons and the rhythms of time. You know, instead, what they the, they have is, you know, I, I watch channel videos, uh, channel travel videos on YouTube, where these people just seem to be desperately moving on and on to find some new thing. But you know, what I've learned is if you know, and they're trying to create memories. But memories, I think, can only be created through commitment and through the marking of time. I'd be interested to think about this in terms of modern story writing, and um, particularly the ways that it occurs within sort of the ways that we consume media and consume being an important word there, and the ways in which those media designed for such consumption are produced. I think, for instance, about the ways that certain series never can reach a sense of satisfactory resolution because things are always re-emerging. There's always this sense of the past being thrown into disarray. I think a good example of this would be the new Star Wars, later Star Wars trilogy, where there was right. throwing into disarray the resolution of the previous, the, the original trilogy. Uh, mm -hmm. All the character development was undermined when you have Han Solo going back to his old way of life as he, and fall, falling away from his marriage. You have Skywalker giving up on, on things. And then you also have this new force arising against um, the rebellion. So the rebellion doesn't actually succeed. And so part of the point and the meaning of um, a just war is that you get a resolution. And so if Star Wars are just... Um, irresolvable if you just have um just interminable star wars then it actually ceases to be meaningful and you're no longer invested likewise if at the end of every series where there's some sort of resolution things are thrown um into an unresolved state because a couple that seem to get together for a while now there's some other person in the mix and now one of them is considering an affair whatever it is there's no sense of resolution. There's no sense of a satisfactory narrative, um, a satisfactory narrative arc, because things are just continually going. And I think that's something that maybe we feel within ourselves that all these oh, yeah. um, old, these old stories are constantly being recycled. But in the process of being recycled, 
it's not that the old story is left intact. The old story is completely undermined. And there's a sense in which the old story cannot mean what it once did because it cannot be, it does not leave that satisfactory silence. It's like a, a, a new passage added to a piece of music that completely destroys the silence of the resolution that ended the original performance. Now, I think there's something about that that's maybe illuminating for the way that our lives function now. They have that same sense of irresolu irresolution. Or we might think about the ways that relationships in traditional storylines often depend upon structures of commitment. And so if you're reading an Austen novel, it depends upon a particular understanding of marriage and what that represents as a commitment and its enduring character. And in the society where you do not have enduring marriages, it does not have the same character, there's less of a sense of the resolution. It just does not have the same significance. Likewise, if there's no sense of the difference between um, singleness and marriage, where there's just lots of um, intermittent and episodic relationships, and then finally mm -hmm. you end up muddle into a relationship with someone and then decide after some years, oh, actually, we might as well get married. Right, right. Um, there's no sense of a divide between those things. Again, those storylines don't make sense. And mm -hmm. things like um, weddings, things like funerals, things like these other things are passages that are narratively significant. They enable us to make transitions in order to retain uh, life that has integrity, continuity between past and future, and enables us to be whole persons. And the more that we've entered a society where we don't make those commitments, where we don't have those transitions, where things are episodic, where the environment is constantly changing around us, we lose the ability to be whole persons. And I think scripture and the structures that it forms us within are very much about enabling us to be those sorts of persons that we are struggling to be within contemporary society. Right. So to kind of uh, start to wind this up, to get back to the initial discussion about imagination, which I think, and I think you understand this very well, involves things like story, involves things like memory, history, all these relationships within time, so that the way we can apply, for instance, if a scientist using his imagination comes up with some question that needs to be uh, looked into, then if to understand where that came from, that imagination, that, that idea, helps us to fully understand what is actually being looked for. That is to say, it's not simply another dead process, you know, something to explain yet one more micro action within the world, although sometimes science does seem like that. But rather that, uh, I think it was Walker Percy who said, you can't imagine a scientist who lives with all of these broken relationships and temporary, uh, you know, dalliances with, you know, in their relationship to actually come up with any sort of science which proves the world has meaning. Because in their life, they're not living that way. And I think what we're seeing now with the interruptions of uh, of social media, of technology, is we're now seeing people who who can hardly concentrate on anything anymore. And so they, it's very difficult for them to imagine that the world has ever been what it is now. And I think there is that relationship between time and imagination. And without a sense of time, the imagination seems to wilt. I wonder whether part of that is just impatience, that one of the things that our modern media do, are they fill up the spaces of boredom, um, the spaces where we might actually have to learn practices of attentiveness, where we might actually have to take time. 
um, and be present in a particular moment. Um, if I can look at my device whenever I'm in a social situation or wherever I'm outside and there's nothing else going on to distract me from that, rather than actually learning to inhabit that moment, I'm not going to practice the sort of attention that I would otherwise um, just do as a matter of course. And so the sorts of things that you would notice if you're on a bus and you don't have your device with you, looking at the people around you, um, all of that thing, that will be closed off to you if you have your device, because it will just take your attention. You're in a moment where there's nothing instantly crying out for your attention. And so you want something to just distract you. And so your device is there. Otherwise, you might actually think and attend to those people around you and think about what that place is like and actually be present in that particular location. And I think that lack of um, attentiveness is one of the things that gets in our way of understanding reality, scripture, ourselves. We don't have the time to be with ourselves, to be attentive, to think about what, to hear a scripture several times over. We're looking, what is the meaning? What's the payoff? What am I supposed to understand from this? What does this lead to in my life? And those are valuable questions, but Scripture is supposed to be meditated upon. This is the primary form of, med of engagement with Scripture that Scripture itself seems to talk about. You meditate upon the text, you chew it over, you ruminate over it. And that is a process that takes a considerable amount of time. And as you devote yourself to that, things start to emerge from the text that you just would not otherwise see. And I think the loss of time and the loss of solitude are two immense losses. So can think about the way that people increasingly are consuming media in a shared um, environment. And so there's the significance of the second screen as we're looking at the first screen of whatever we're following on Netflix, for instance, or what show we've watched on our TVs or the um, film that we've watched recently, we're looking at the second screen. There's all these people's reactions to it. And so those two things in concert mean that it's very difficult for us actually to be attentive to things on their own terms, because our reaction to them is already given to us by that social, um, by our social group, by the people with whom we are associated, who tell us the political salience of this particular piece of art and how we might per perceive it. This is one of the areas where um, Lewis's work on um, how to read, I think, is very helpful. Just the importance of, <laughs> again, attention. And all the people mm -hmm. that I find most helpful on these sorts of questions, they independently argue this seem to argue the same thing. It's that process of just being attentive and engaging with things, of allowing the reality to raise its questions to you. And then as the reality speaks to you, rather than, I think this is one of the problems I have with the idea of inter interpretation. We come to reality almost as if it were inert and we have to give it voice through our act of interpretation. Rather than being those who come to a reality that's speaking, if only we would listen carefully enough. And so imagination, I think, is that process of allowing our mental frameworks to be shaken by reality as we're attuning ourselves to it. And so the way that Barfield describes this, I think, is very formative for me, just thinking about um, the process of science as a sort of attuning yourself to reality imaginatively and recognizing that as you're attuning yourself to reality, that's where the hypotheses come from. Is the question that you raised earlier, where did the hypotheses come from? They come from that yeah. process of attuning ourselves. And likewise with scripture, likewise with our lives, if we're going to understand anything, we need to be silent and present with it and attentive to it. And that is not an easy thing to learn. Well, that sounds like a very good way to conclude. And uh, uh, with the admonition to, you know, take back some time from 
the technology and the media and and to learn uh i'm fortunate i live near a mountain and so i can literally within five, 10 minutes be hiking and uh even though i live in a huge city and uh that's but and in doing that you immediately start engaging and i can take photos i can i i don't take uh I don't go out there and then look at anything uh, in my hand and any device. Um, more often, I just go up and just be, you know, sometimes I'll pray. Sometimes I'll just look around. Uh, but it's, it's that whole approach to reality that I think is so important. And um, I used to say to people in New York, you know, if God is speaking to us in nature, how would you know when was the last time you were in nature? You know, so, well, Alistair, thank you very much for spending uh, this time with us it's today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And uh, there is so much more. Obviously, we could have this conversation on many, many, many sessions, and hopefully we'll, we will have more sessions. And I wish you a, a meaningful 2023, and uh, I hope your life has new experiences that you can mark in time. And, and I find that marking the experiences in time in different ways makes time thicker. You know, so. that's definitely been my, ex my experience. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I'm older. People say, Oh, your time must go by quickly. I go, no, it doesn't because I've learned to mark time. I've learned to inhabit it rather than simply exist within it. So Okay. Uh, someday I hope to meet Susanna. So <laughs> that'd be wonderful. You you should come here. We sometime. would love to come to Georgia at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, give. Uh, I would say wait until there's some sort of resolution on the war. But yep. even then, uh, I am planning an event, um, and uh, later in the year, uh, where I'm just inviting about. Uh, 12, 13 people to come here and I'll help everyone arrange everything, but we're going to spend, it, it would be about 10 days. Uh, half of that time would be spent doing cultural things in, in the city. And I think there's a lot that people would find really fascinating. And then the other half, the, at least four days would be spent in the mountains in October, kind of having discussions, but also going out, uh, alone and you know, for walks, and I know this small village that would be perfect for this. So, anyway, it's just something to think. That about. sounds a bit. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as the Georgians say, "Drobit," which means temporarily, we will meet again. So, God bless. Take care. Well, I'd like to thank Alistair Roberts, theologian, thinker, newlywed. And I'm sure we will be talking to him again sometime. It was a fascinating discussion. Uh, lots of ideas going back and forth. And that's just what I like. And that's about it. We have more coming up, of course. Uh, I can't say exactly when. Uh, the cute of the creepy is out there circling around. But meanwhile, I'd like to thank you for dropping in and remind you, support the channel in any way you wish. And... Spread the word, if it's a good word for you. And let's see. Well, it's like the Georgians say, Drobit, which translates into temporarily. We'll just be gone from each other for a while, but we will meet again. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.
imagination. Because what else is paralysis? The imagination has been so debased that imagination, being imaginative, rather than being the linchpin of our existence, now stands as a synonym for something outside ourselves, like science fiction or some new use for tangerine slices on raw pork chops. What an imaginative summer recipe. And Star Wars, so imaginative. And, and Star Trek, so imaginative. And Lord of the Rings, all those dwarves, so imaginative. The imagination has moved out of the realm of being our link, our most personal link with our inner lives, and the world outside that world, and this world we share.